So good afternoon everyone and welcome to our conversation on NGM President Jerry Mandarin. Um, today we're going to hear from several presentations, seven presenters, and the first one is Brianna Webster. She has a PhD in Criminology and Sociology at Villanova um, and she's done an extensive study with her partner Rory over there in the corner. Um, so I'm just going to turn it over to Brianna. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for having us today. Um, So Rory and I are really excited to share some of our research we've been working on for several years. Um, part of the reason why we do what we do is to share it with folks like ourselves. So this is a really exciting day for us to, uh, to be here. So uh, without further ado, um, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with graphs like this, but since it's Saturday, just a little reminder um, that the U.S. has one of the highest incarceration rates in the world, um, and the state, federal, and uh, local jails, we have approximately 2.1 uh, million Americans incarcerated. There are many, many consequences of locking up this many citizens. Um, but today, we're going to talk specifically about how that affects democracy. So, we have two pillars of democracy. Um, one is universal suffrage, the right to vote. And the other is equal representation, commonly known as the one person, uh, one vote rule. But mass incarceration threatens American democracy. Um, by, by having this many people incarcerated. Um, we're the only modern democracy in the world where individuals convicted of a felony are prohibited from voting after they've been released from prison in many cases. This issue has been getting a lot of attention in recent years. Um, and as a result, some of the laws have been changed. In fact, just this week, we had presidential uh, Democratic primary candidates talking about um, whether currently incarcerated folks uh, should be able to vote in, because in 48 states, incarcerated people cannot currently vote. Wow. Um, and, and so while felon disenfranchisement has gotten a lot of attention, what's gotten a lot less attention which is what we're here to talk explicitly about today, is the issue of equal representation. And you might have heard this called prison gerrymandering. Um, and so we're gonna be focusing on how uh, prison gerrymandering in Pennsylvania distorts all of our political representation. So, um, The first thing to know about uh, prison gerrymandering is that, and issues of representation, is that these um, issues affect political inequality long before elections occur. Right? So it's totally separate from the felon disenfranchisement issue. Um, and as I mentioned a few minutes ago, it's a critical part of having a democracy. So, um, because in order to have democracy in a large nation state, we have to have equal representation, right? But as you can imagine, the issues of how do we define equal representation has pretty much always been contentious since the United States was founded. Right? You might remember from grade school, um, uh, you know, the debate of um, that eventually became known as the Three Fifths Clause. Right? The founding fathers were um, arguing over how to count enslaved populations for purposes of political representation, um, and it eventually decided they eventually decided that slave persons would be counted as three fifths as a person in order to um, draw political districts. Even after um, we passed the Fourteenth Amendment, which was. Um, in 1868, we still had districts across the United States as well as within states that varied dramatically in size. 
It wasn't until uh, the Civil Rights Movement when uh, the Supreme Court ruled in the Baker v. Carr case that um, in 1962 that equal representation had to be defined as one person equals one vote. Okay? So that's how we define equal representation today. Um, and so it's based on total population counts. Uh, you don't, importantly, under this definition, have to be eligible to vote, right? It's based on total population. Um, and so even though incarcerated persons cannot currently vote in 48 states right now, including Pennsylvania, it's irrelevant for our purposes of political representation because it's based on total population counts, right? Can I, can I get a quick clarification? Yes. When you make a statement, that in 48 states, um, individuals can't vote. That means while they're in prison. Yes. Okay. And so that's a, that's different from the fact that they walk out the door. In 26 of those 48 states, their rights come back. Right. And there are varying <coughs> levels. In some cases, right. um, there. So some states, a few still have lifetime disenfranchisement bans. Some of them have you have to complete your probation or parole until you can vote. Some of them, like Florida, is now arguing that you have to have paid, paid all of your fines and fees in order to be able to vote. So there's a number of different models floating around out there. But yes, in 48 states, I think I just needed to speak louder. It's not getting all the way back. Um, currently, but for our purposes here, you're still in the population, and in terms of proportioning political districts, we count children, we count non-citizens, we count everybody for political apportionment, right? Okay, thank you, good question. Um, okay, so if all we need are these total population counts, it shouldn't be that hard. The reason why we're all here today, though, is to understand that the census um, counts people as residents of the correctional facilities in the districts where they are incarcerated. Why do they do this? Because they establish what they, they have what they call a usual residence rule. And under the usual residence rule, um, it requires people to be counted in the place where they live and sleep most of the time. So under that usual residence rule, incarcerated persons are counted at the correctional facilities where they're incarcerated. This might not matter that much if prisons and incarcerated persons were randomly distributed across space, right, and across racial groups. In that case, it probably wouldn't affect political representation. But I'm sure, as all of you know, incarceration is heavily concentrated by both geography and by race. Most prisons are located in rural, predominantly white areas, while most incarcerated persons are originating from predominantly black and Latinx communities in primarily urban areas. Up until the 1970s, so this usual residence rule has been in place since the census began in 1790. And it's important to know that the reason we started the census in the first place was to apportion political districts. That was its sole original purpose, right? But in 1790, when we started, um, worrying about how to count local populations like prisoners, there were so few, few people incarcerated at that time that it didn't really have a meaningful effect on political representation. Fast forward to mass incarceration, and the census never changed how they count incarcerated people despite having several million Americans behind bars, right? Um, so can I ask you before you go to yes. the next one? The usual residence, um, are prisoners usual residents just for the census or their usual residents all year long when they're in these prisons? It is just the day that the census is taken, right? Which is part of what I know you're particularly interested in because the census is only taken every 10 years, right? And most people are, the average incarceration sentence is under three years, right? So if you are incarcerated on the day that the census is taken, you are counted as a resident of that prison for the next 10 years for our census purpose. And that's the unconstitutional part. Hold on. We're getting there. Right? She's excited. Huh? <laughs> so I, I want to take a quick look um, visually. I know it's a little bit hard on our great background, but I'm a visual person to show you some pictures of what it looks like in Pennsylvania. Um, so we can look at this is census data, and there's one dot per person. 
This is looking um, in northeastern uh, Philadelphia, um, so area that, that many of us are familiar with. And the census dot project means that one dot equals one person. We have to thank John Pfaff, who's a law professor at Fordham, for um, pointing out that we can look at prison location and the number of people incarcerated using this data. What I just want to highlight is that in northeastern Pennsylvania, it's pretty, people are pretty spread out. And yet you can see the dark green circle up at the top. That's greater for prison. And that's, as you can see, the, the green represents uh, black Pennsylvania residents. There are several thousand black residents concentrated in District 150 <coughs> in what used to be Greater Ford, which has now been renamed uh, SCI Phoenix. And there's also um, another, another uh, gym facility in District 150. So there are over 5,000 residents in District 150 in Pennsylvania right now who are physically incarcerated, right? So the, the lighter green shows um, is Montgomery County Jail. This is a district where we can see a very large portion of people are incarcerated and the rest of the district is largely white um, and is, is largely suburban. So let's look at a couple of others so you can see. This is District 88, which is um, Harrisburg area. SCI Camp Hill, which is the um, main intake facility for men's for incarcerated men in Pennsylvania. Um, again, you can see the green line where all of the largely um, black men right, are being held in Camp Hill's facility. And you, know, you can see Harrisburg is you know, a populous area, but it's still largely white, um, largely suburban, right? And you can see that all of the people of color are primarily concentrated in Camp Hill, right? And a whole bunch of people is what you can see it's when all the dots are clustered together. She is. No, he is. Um, you can't see this at all, but this is literally um, SCI Forest. Uh, and my, the reason why I'm showing you this is that it is extremely rural district in northwestern Pennsylvania. It is literally containing the Allegheny National uh, State Forest. And right here, in the middle of that really rural district, is SCI Forest containing several thousand uh, incarcerated people that are mostly black. You can see this is a little bit better because it's a lot more populated area, but this is Philadelphia's jail facilities district. Three of those four districts are in Philadelphia, and uh, three, so, so the districts that are too large in Philly are districts 197, districts 179, and district 203. The only district that's not in Philly that gains too many people that is constitutionally too large is uh, District 71, which is, um, contains Johnstown, so it's a city in an otherwise rural area. But importantly, when we, um, so those four districts in Pennsylvania represent 264,000 Pennsylvania residents who are not getting their fair representation, right? They're underrepresented. And because, again, this is concentrated along black and uh, Latinx communities, 100,000 black Philadelphia residents are underrepresented because they live in these communities that are too large to be a district under the Supreme Court's definition of equal representation. All three of those districts, importantly, are majority minority districts. So what that means in order to fairly represent under the Supreme Court's definition, um, in all likelihood, it suggests that Philly would get another majority minority district in order to satisfy the Voting Rights Act criteria, okay? which is huge in terms of representation, um, to have a whole other majority minority district. Um, and can you explain it just a little bit more, the majority minority district to gain another one? What would it what would that mean for Philadelphia? It would mean that you would have a whole nother representative arguing for you in the Pennsylvania State House. Yeah, in yeah another representative that's what, that we're supposed to have, but we don't because of what they don't. That's what you think. Right. One person who is solely focused on, so a majority minority district means it's a majority community of color district, right? The majority of the residents who live there um, are minorities and it ends because, yeah. So you're, you're losing out on a whole person whose complete job and career is to represent your community's needs. 
Thank you. Um, those 100,000 black Philadelphians that are living in these three districts that are underrepresented, that's 20% of Philadelphia black residents. So one in five Philadelphia black residents is not getting their equal representation under the constitutional ruling. Um, and, and, and the uh, the Voting Rights Act is what defines, is what keeps, so when there's enough people of color concentrated in a certain area, that's what designates the, um, what fulfills the criteria to get a majority minority district, right? Um, okay. So I'm, I'm wrapping it up, I promise. Uh, I just want to talk about, so while we're here in Philly and there's a huge impact on Philly specifically, I want to show you that it's not just living in Philly that affects um, your representation. So we did some calculations to figure out how it, um, how counting prisoners as residents of the correctional facilities where they're incarcerated um, affects the average Pennsylvania resident's representation. So what my bar graph shows you on the, um, the first, first block shows you that the, if we counted prisoners in their home districts for political apportionment, the average white voter in Pennsylvania would lose 59 people from their district, right? Because whites tend to live in districts that are more rural, more suburban, where prisons are located. So the average person would lose 59. In contrast, you can see the huge bars on the right-hand side of the graph, the average black voter would gain over 353 new residents in their districts for purposes of political apportionment. Right? Similarly, the average Latinx voter would gain about 313 new people to be counted in their district in order to get fair representation. So to sum up, um, we have four districts that are legally too small. Those are all rural or suburban districts. We have four districts that are legally too big. Those are primarily urban districts, or in the case of Johnstown, a city in a, in a rural district. We've got black and Latinx residents dramatically underrepresented, especially here in Philly. Um, and importantly, there's been a lot of discussion on racial gerrymandering. All of this happens before we ever draw the boundaries, right? It, and, and so it's this um, very, this is an intentional policy, right? We can talk for a long time about how some of the things that the consequences of incarceration, legislators argue that we just didn't think through and realize that that was gonna be an outcome of having mass incarceration. <laughs> this policy is not in that group, right? This is intentionally counting prisoners where they are not members of the community, which is hurting their home communities, right? So it's not that they're um, just missing from their communities, right? We talk about, you know, how there are thousands of, um, you know, Philadelphia men right now incarcerated. They're not just missing from their own districts, they're advantaging other districts, mm -hmm. right? Other districts making them more privileged, giving them more power and representation in the state legislature. Right? So um, all the fights that we had and the, the really important um, progress that was made in the 1960s with the Voting Rights Act, which helped advance fair representation for everybody, is completely undone by our system of mass incarceration. Right? It's achieving it in a brand new way. And for a while, we didn't even realize how big it was affecting us. And that's what Rory and I are trying to draw attention to today. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you. I really want to thank Brianna for this presentation. But we should look at everything that's on this discussion. Um, and it's not today because we're kind of got short on time. Come back to it because if these are illegally too small, we need to be looking at this and see how we address this and make this right so that we get our votes and our voices back. Um, everything on here. So thank you, Brianna. Different, different issues and concerns. I'm finding, I'm so, finding many, so many different mentalities different mentality today. It, it, it seems hard. It seems challenging. It seems challenging. I don't say hard because the only, only thing hard, hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything, everything else is a challenge. Else is a challenge. Um, um,
so, so, so I'm ready for, I'm this, ready challenge. for this challenge. And I was built, and I was for, built this. for this. I think that, I think we, that all we all have a purpose, purpose in life. And mine's and mine's is gonna take on a task that most that most of back away back from, away from. from. That impossible, that people say it's impossible. I see possibilities.